Welcome to the Real Life Resilience Podcast. Stories of recovery from life's most difficult trauma with Stacey Brookman. One of the things I have to do later is do my half an hour of journaling. Truth is, I don't feel like doing it because I know what's on my mind right now and how painful it is. So I don't want to deal with that. And part of me says, look, I'd much rather go to the bar and just get a drink. The choice that I have is to do the thing that's easy, grab a drink at the bar or go and show up for myself. This is Stacy Brookman, and I'm glad you're listening to Real Life Resilience, the podcast that brings you a range of tools and stories to heal from tough life situations. Have you known someone who lives with mental health challenges, or do you want to learn to better manage your own mental health? If so, you'll love this week's interview. Mike Vini managed to overcome a lifetime of mental health challenges to become a professional drummer and one of America's leading mental health speakers. Before we dig into this fascinating interview, let me share something that might change your life. You've always been a strong person, stronger than you realize, actually. But sometimes, thinking about the past unearths emotions and memories that are painful. Let us take you step by step through discovering your life story and the wisdom and healing power that it holds. Register now for Stacy's next free webinar where she reveals the four simple, proven methods to writing the first chapter of your life story this week. Simply click on the link in the show notes or head to stacybrookman.com slash webinar. I love to hear from listeners personally and I answer my own emails. So drop me a line and let me know what you found interesting in this episode or to ask me a question. My email is stacy at stacybrookman.com. Now let's welcome a TEDx speaker and mental health advocate, Mike Vini. Well, hello, Stacey, and hello to your listeners. I am a mental health speaker and a corporate drumming facilitator. Those are two very uh, interesting (laughs) things. As I said that, I realized how strange it sounds. I spend (laughs) my weeks traveling around the country, speaking at events about the stigma surrounding mental health Mm -hmm. and how to transform it. And one of the things that helped me in my journey with my mental health challenges was drumming. So I became a drummer and I also do corporate drumming with different groups of people because, you know, mental health issues and people issues go hand in hand. Right. And the drumming allows me to work on the people side of things where the mental health stuff allows me to talk about some of the internal things. Oh, wow. That's so fascinating. I don't think I've ever had a person that that spoke about drumming on my podcast at all. <laughs> <laughs> or well, 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 or uh, mental health, though, but but not drumming and mental health. So Yeah, and the challenge is I might start tapping, which if I do that, just yell at me and I will stop. Sometimes That's fine. I do that, <laughs> <laughs> Mike, you have really, I've, I've been so inspired by looking at your website and watching your videos, but you have an amazing story to tell. And it's a story of tragedy, but also of resilience. So can you give us a synopsis of what you've been through and how you came through that? Sure. Mental health issues are a big topic right now. They're very popular. At the same time, it's quite taboo. And it's interesting how it can be both simultaneously. And I started my journey with mental health issues when I was younger. Um, And I say journey because it has been a journey of discovery. And for many people, mental health problems manifest as behavior problems. Mm -hmm. And for me, I was a child who just was misbehaving. I, I couldn't control my emotions or my temper. And This led to me um, really lashing out at my parents and and teachers, and I ended up getting hospitalized in a mental hospital three times for extended periods of time. Wow! I got expelled from three schools for behavior problems. I attempted to take my own life by suicide at age 10. Uh I was regularly self-harming, and I was violent at home. So in many ways, I was the poster child for mental health issues. Wow, that is amazing. So tell me, what happened to transform you, or how how did you come through that and come out of that? You know, it, it's interesting. A lot of times people ask me that, and my answer, as, as I'm like sitting here talking to you, is, is thinking, well, I'm still working on it. I'm still trying <laughs> to transform out of it. And 
you know, it, it's gotten more manageable. I don't self harm anymore, and for the most part, my behavior is is legal mm-hmm. and uh, not harming anyone. I don't, Wait a minute, know, for the park. most part, or <laughs> yeah, well, 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 I have some parking tickets. Okay, that's, what I was gonna all say. Right. That's, that's where I act out now, <laughs> and, and occasionally, sometimes things out of my mouth are just inappropriate right. in certain situations, but nothing, nothing more than the norm. Trust me, right. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Nowadays, I'm doing much better, but I still struggle with, you know, depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, about an hour before we spoke tonight, I uh, was outside taking a walk, just trying to get myself together emotionally so I could try to be emotionally available for this call mm-hmm. because my anxiety was picking up and so was my depression. Right. So was there one moment in time for you that was it was a turning point where you said, okay, I can manage this or, or one skill that you learned at some point that helped you manage what was going on? Absolutely. And, you know, as I'm thinking about this, I learned that skill this year. And the skill was, it's actually several parts to the skill. But the first one was being able to admit to myself that I am powerless over my emotions. And that has been incredibly humbling. And it doesn't make that an excuse for my behavior, but it reminds me every day that these emotions have power over me and therefore I need to do something about it every day. Mm. The other thing that I've learned with that is probably the hardest thing in the world, but one of the most powerful is learning to sit with your feelings. Oh, yeah. That's very tough. And how did you learn that? (laughs) Well, I was um, struggling this year. I had a breakdown actually back in in the winter Mm -hmm. and um, started the year just from end of January for the next few months. It was just, it was bad. And I ended up hospitalized and uh, my therapist was, I was on a system where she called me every day if I didn't call her just to make sure I was alive and okay. Wow. And I ended up even getting a second therapist, a psychiatrist involved and a support group. And um, one of the things just my therapist said to me, I was frustrated in her office because I just wanted the, the pain to go away. Because for me, the, the mental health issues get so intense, the depression gets so intense that it becomes physical. Mm. It takes over my body and becomes physical pain. And I... I just wanted it to go away. And she just looked at me and said, when are you going to learn just to sit with your feelings? Wow. And I was so angry at her <laughs> because, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm trying to pay money to help myself. And you're just going to tell me to sit with my feelings. Like, seriously. <laughs> right. <laughs> it turned out to be one of the greatest tools in my toolbox. Wow. So it, that's a reminder because that happened this year. That's a, mm-hmm. a, a but yet you've been successful and, and you're an adult and you're living life, and so it's a great reminder that resilience isn't just a one and done. You know, I've fixed myself and I can move on. It's constant for a lot of people to work to be a resilient person. Absolutely, I I totally agree with you, and I. Remind people, especially your listeners out there, that it's a process, not a destination. Mm -hmm. We live in a world that, like, uh, let's say your car is having an issue and you take it to a mechanic. You want to get the issue fixed. And if the mechanic came to you and said, Stacy, we're going to have to talk because under the hood, the car has had a traumatic history. And we're going to have to have it come back several times, and I want to discuss the history with you. You would get frustrated very quickly and just, <laughs> what is wrong right. with this mechanic? <laughs> you know, fix my car. And, and, and we, we can laugh about that, but that's how we approach mental health. Right. We want to fix it the same way. We just give me an answer, help me fix my issues. And the reality is it's complex. Mm-hmm. It's a process. And I have found that for me, recovery has actually become discovery. Oh, wow. I like that. Because it is an ongoing process and it's different for every single person, right? Absolutely. Yeah. It's always, and you know what, even within a person, it's evolving. So the challenges I struggled with five years ago look much different than they do right now. Right. So what happened when you were 10 years old and you, you know, you obviously weren't successful with a, a suicide attempt, but um, tell me how you, you came through that and recovered from that. Did, did you go to school? And tell me about that. Well, and, and thank you for asking about that. Um, 
you know, like I just said before about the car thing, wanting to get the car fixed, I wanted a solution. Mm -hmm. And mental health issues are frustrating and confusing for everyone, especially kids who just don't have that awareness of who they are yet. Right. And I, I just wanted a solution to just end it all. And and I knew that other people ended their lives and I just I just wanted to do, to do it too. I was done. And so um I I overdosed on, on medication and mm. my mom found me and and got me the help that I needed. And um, you know, from there, you know, how did I get past that? Well, they kept putting me in, in therapy and increasing my, my medication. So I think what it did is it temporarily took away the symptoms of pain, but it didn't really get at the core issue. It wasn't only until years later that I really started to explore things that things got better. Now, w at what point in time did you start exploring things? Did you take kind of like your, your own mental health in your own hands and start looking at, at other avenues of being mentally healthy? Well, I, I think it was around um, 10th grade. I was hospitalized for the third time and I was just done with it again, frustrated, mm -hmm. you know, like I don't, don't want to keep coming here. And and when I wasn't hospitalized, it was on a first name basis with the police in the local oh, emergency room. Right. You know, I, I knew their favorite sports teams, like their, uh -huh. the kids names. And, and, you know, I just, I was tired of it. I was tired of it. There's gotta be more to life than this. And I just want to experience happiness. And at that point, mm -hmm. I just said, I, I need to do something different. I don't know what it is. And truth be told again, it was a turning point, but it's it's a turning point every single day for me, Stacy, because right. I have to make that decision every day. Mm -hmm. Is it hard to make that decision every day? Absolutely. I was thinking about it before because uh, you and I are recording this this podcast episode, and one of the things I have to do a little later is do my half an hour of journaling. Oh, good and, for you! Yeah. Well, truth is, I don't feel like doing it mm -hmm. because I know what's on my mind right now and how painful it is. Right. So I don't, I don't, I don't want to deal with that. And part of me says, look, I'm in a hotel. I'd much rather go to the bar and just get a drink, mm -hmm. you know, but the choice that I have is to do the thing that's easy and say, let me just grab a drink at the bar or go and show up for myself with my journal. Right. And so that being said, I promise you and your listeners that I am going to use my journal after this. Fabulous. Because you're investing in yourself and if you stop investing in yourself then there you know what's left? You've got to invest in yourself. Absolutely. That's wonderful. Tell me about what is your relationship like with your parents now? Oh, I'm sure that was hard for them. Great question. Okay, <laughs> I definitely gonna need to take the journal out after this. Now, my <laughs> oh no. <laughs> um, sadly, about a year and a half ago, my mom passed away uh, from cancer. Mm. So it's been a very. Mm. I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah, it was a. It's been been a, been a tough year and a half, but you know what? It's also been a very honest year and a half with reflecting and taking in, in inventory on that relationship and the relationship with my dad is okay. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to say it's bad. It's definitely not bad. It's, it's just mm -hmm. okay. And, and I think um, I've always lacked a certain connection to my parents there. They weren't uh, people that have lots of friends or be very social. And I actually think that's one of the reasons behind my depression, my anxiety, my OCD is that if a child has a parent that's emotionally unavailable, that doesn't know how to have, you know, healthy social skills, well, a child can't learn to self-soothe when they are having a problem. So, right. you know, I, I've i really had to learn a lot about that. I'm, I'm still learning about that, let me say that, to be honest. And when it comes to my parents, again, the, it's an okay relationship, but nothing you know, to, to really be like, yes, about, we have conversations all the time. And, you know, uh, my dad and my brother and I will go out and grab food here and there and laugh, but you know, that's about it. it it's healthy as it could be, I guess. Mm -hmm. Does it scare you to get into any relationship with someone? Oh, I love your questions. <laughs> <laughs> wow. This is getting real. Okay. Um, well, actually I, I am in a relationship with someone mm -hmm. and, you know, it, how can I put it? It's an interesting process because she has had to learn a lot of skills 
to learn about me and to understand me and to realize that some of my behavior might be different than what is expected in a given situation. For example, um, one of the triggers for me is issues with um, pets and animals. Mm Mm-hmm. And so, um, and, and a lot of times I hate saying that because if somebody told me that, I would just laugh. I'd be like, seriously, like, what, what, what's wrong with you? You know? Right. And, uh, <laughs> and so I, I guess I'm laughing at myself, but I have some um, weird thing with pets. And um, about a month ago, my, my fish died. And he was probably the best pet I ever had in my life. Oh. And so I'm struggling because... I'm constantly obsessing about the fish, mm-hmm. even though the fish is dead. I could go to the pet store, spend three bucks and get another one. Like right. it's, it's not about that. It's something about the loss of it, but that sometimes takes away from my relationship with her because I'm not as present as I could be. Right. And she's understanding that when I bring up the fish, it's not just me talking about the fish to talk about the fish. It's, it's, it's serious obsession going on in that given moment. Right, right. I'm familiar with OCD, so I I get that. I really do. Yeah. Tell me about what other coping skills have you discovered along the way? And you mentioned drumming. Is that one of your coping skills? (laughs) It is. And I have so much to say about coping skills because um, I'm a big believer in Mm self-care. And I did an article for Health Central titled How to Practice Self-Care Without Feeling Selfish because a lot of people think if they do something for themselves, they're being selfish. Right. And it's it's a phrase that we throw around a lot in health. So when, when you write an article, I, I think it's always good to try to sound smart by quoting a study uh-huh. or quoting you know somebody with a lot of credentials. And so I actually found a study on self-care. And I think it might have been through the National Institute of Health. I'm not really sure, but it was a big organization like that. And it actually said that of people with chronic health conditions, only 5% practice self-care. Oh. So statistically, that's zero. So basically, it's a nonsense term that we all throw around, tell each other to do, mm-hmm. but nobody's doing right. it. And, and, and the, one of the things that I've learned is there's a difference between self-care and escape activities. And people don't understand that sometimes. Escape activities are television, mm-hmm. you know, Facebook, which can, can also be its own mental health issue. True. But, you know, things like that, you know, just, just sitting around with your friends and drinking, that, that's an escape activity. But doing something proactive that nurtures your soul and your spirit, like exercise, writing in a journal. Being in a healthy relationship where you can listen to someone who's struggling and give them support. Uh, spending time outside where you're just breathing in fresh air. Uh, writing in a gratitude journal. Things like that. That's self-care. So I do a lot of stuff like that. And that has really had a dramatic impact on my life. Mm, fabulous. When, when did you discover that? Or did you, did you self-discover it? Or were you doing research and you came across it and you started started those habits? I actually really came across it when um, I picked up uh, Hal Elrod's book, The Miracle Morning, oh, yeah. which talks about morning routines. And he has an acronym called Life Savers, S-A-V-E-R-S. And it's not, not like the candy, but the first S stands for silence. The A stands for affirmations. V stands for visualization. E stands for exercise. R stands for reading. And the last S stands for scribing, which is writing. Oh. And I try to do those six things each day. Now, today, I totally didn't get to it. Travel day just wasn't going to work. Mm-hmm. But when I do those things, it puts me in a position to be emotionally available for the different stresses that come up in my life right, and the people in my life. it's You've built your resilience strategies there that bolster you up. Love that. Yep. I love that. So uh, I'm going to ask you again about the <laughs> drumming. Tell, tell me more about the drumming <laughs> part of it. That's, that's uh, interesting to me. The drumming part of it, you know... Um, yeah, I. It's funny. It's interesting to everybody but me. I guess I just. I'm thinking in my head. What well, I like to hit stuff. I don't know. Um, no, I, I love the sound of drums. Um, last week, I had two giant shipments of boxes land at hotels throughout the country. One in Arkansas, one in Orlando, because I was doing this drum circle 
uh, thing with two different groups of people. And I give everybody instruments and we all play. Mm. And everyone's in a circle and everyone has to make music together. And it's a beautiful opportunity for adults to be in a situation that's healthy for bonding. Everyone in a circle feels like an equal Mm -hmm. because you're sitting shoulder to shoulder. You can see everyone's face. So we're all fools together. (laughs) And it's, it's just really fun. There's lots of laughter, lots of games, and it's a great practice ground to teach team building skills to people as we drum and make some cool music together. So that's what I do, and I I absolutely enjoy it. Oh, that sounds so fun. Now, one last question. If people are listening and they're struggling in their lives with whatever struggles they have, because everyone has different struggles, what would you recommend for resilience? What's what's the first or second step that you would recommend? The first step, and I I learned this from Monica Lewinsky. (laughs) Monica Lewinsky, yep, <laughs> we're going to talk about Monica mm. Lewinsky for a moment here. She, uh, she's a speaker now, and one of the things that she has brought up, I'm going to paraphrase how she said it, but when she decided to speak about the things she became famous for, mm-hmm. it took away the issue's power. And I find that to be a really profound insight because when you talk about your issues, you take away their power. So many of your listeners who are listening right now might be struggling with an issue that they just have never talked about, that they are are burying deep down inside. And the thing that I encourage you to do if you're listening is to talk about it. You don't have to say everything, but just try to get started and say something. Find someone that you trust, especially a mental health professional, and Just talk about it. It's one of the greatest things that you can do to free yourself from it and to find happiness. Wow. Very wise words. Mike, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us. And tell us where we can find more more about you. Well, thank you for having me, Stacey. My website is www.transformingstigma.com. And if you Google my name, it's Mike Vini. The last name is V like in Victor, E is in Edward, N is in Nancy Y. There are tons of videos on YouTube, my TEDx talk and short films that I've been in. And I encourage you to check those out and, and reach out to me. Leave a comment. I respond to everything and I would love to hear from you. If I could ever be of help to you, please reach out. Fabulous. You're very inspiring and thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome to Stacy's Journal. In this segment, I let you peek into my journal as I share my thoughts on a topic or resilience resource. One of the things that Mike recommended as a first step for anyone with tough issues is to talk about it. In fact, this interview has been one of my favorites because Mike himself was unafraid to talk about his suicide attempts and his struggles. We often find ourselves in a culture of secrecy. Just think about how many women spoke up in 2017 about sexual harassment and who kept those secrets for sometimes decades. And think about the women who are still not speaking up because they are afraid. I get it. I've kept secrets I shouldn't have too. In fact, most of my life, I never spoke up for myself until I was in my 40s. Writing my stories helped me get clear about them and to share them with others. Listen, you should never suffer alone. Others may share your thoughts and opinions or even have similar issues, but they might be unwilling to speak up. By speaking your truth and sharing your stories, you encourage them to voice their opinions as well. I can teach you how to share your story in my upcoming webinar, Four Simple Proven Methods to Writing the First Chapter of Your Life Story in Just Seven Days. It's for writers and non-writers. And it's a great way to get started, especially if you've been hesitant to tell your stories. Head over to stacybrookman.com slash webinar for that. That's all we have for today. Last episode, Sharon Roth Lichtenfeld talked about finding peace and joy in the midst of adversity. So if adversity is camped out at your house, you might want to go back and have a listen. Next week, we'll interview Luis Congdon, who talks about sharing his story publicly and how to craft beautiful words from your life. I love interacting with our listeners on social media. We're on Pinterest, Facebook, and just about anywhere you can hold a great virtual conversation. 
One more thing, we're having fun counting down the 100 most important memoirs of the past 200 years. So our memoir of the day is the autobiography of Malcolm X. In the searing pages of this classic autobiography, Malcolm X, the Muslim leader and anti-integrationist, tells the extraordinary story of his life and the growth of the Black Muslim movement to veteran writer and journalist Alex Haley. In a unique collaboration, Haley worked with Malcolm X for nearly two years, interviewing, listening to, and understanding the most controversial leader of his time. Check out the autobiography of Malcolm X and all the memoirs on this list at stacybrookman.com slash 100 memoirs. And always remember that life is a story and it's never too late to start telling yours.